can't even see the little nutlets yet. The little nutlets are still hidden inside all these leaves. Paul Winger is the first vice president of the California Farm Bureau Federation and an almond and walnut grower in West Modesto. He recently returned from testifying before Congress about the shortage of bees for pollination. On Friday morning, Wenger talked to the bee about farming, marketing, and environmental issues. The walnut and the almond industry uh, right now, well, there's a couple of things that have made them so successful. Number one, we have a cheap dollar overseas, so exports are an all-time high. Uh, normally, that would be the only reason that we see a growth in the market of almonds and walnuts because of the exports. We export around 64 or 60 percent of our walnut uh, production in California is exported and almost 80 percent of the almond production is exported. So we're really dependent on those markets. But now what we're seeing with all the Mediterranean diet and the health benefits, boy, the nut industry right now, you talk about olive oils, fresh fruits and vegetables, but almonds and walnuts play very much into a healthy eating, healthy diet. The FDA coming out saying that an ounce and a half of walnuts a day will reduce your uh, cholesterol levels. Um, so people don't necessarily want to always pop a pill, but they're looking at healthy eating. So I think that no matter what happens on the world, um, monetary markets, I think we're going to just see things continually to grow for almonds and walnuts. It used to be that it was always a specialty product. I would talk to farmers and they'd say, what do you produce? Almonds and walnuts. Well, that's not something that people need. It's not a staple. But it is becoming a staple in a diet. We prepare uh, to the point that you never know when something can happen. Like two years ago, almond prices spiked, then they dropped precipitously, and then they came back to a sustainable level. That was the market. That, I, the market was going along fine. I think the grower community or the marketing community got a little bit greedy. They held product off the market. Prices spiked until the buyer community said no. Then it went the other way and fell precipitously until people finally said, we're not going to sell that cheap. And now we've hit a happy medium in the $2 range, in the 250 range. So I think that that's a sustainable level for almond producers, and it's also a sustainable level for the marketers. So we've learned to be better marketers. Um, but in when you're in agriculture, you always, you better prepare for the bad years. I think for the nut industry, one of the main things is to make sure that we have the market access funds um, to be able to get our product overseas and to help open up new markets because that is still a very important part. And then the other one is the technical advisory or the technical assistance uh, program they have through the uh, USDA. This is where if a country all of a sudden puts some kind of a non-tariff trade barrier, you know, not a monetary barrier, but they say, well, your almonds, your walnuts, your product, whatever it is, especially product is we have in California, and they'll say, well, you have something that we don't want. Maybe you have a pest in your state we don't want here, and it's not true. Or they say that there's something about that product. Um, we had that in India a number of years ago in almonds, and we were able to use those technical uh, assistance funds to be able to prove that their issue was not a real issue. And it was just something that they were trying to increase the price that they could uh, charge us uh, for coming in uh, on tariffs. Those are the kinds of funds that help not only the grower because they improve the market access, but they help everybody along the line, the packager, the trucker, the shipper, everybody helps. It's not just a direct payment to the farmer. Farmers everywhere along the line as well as processors are looking to make sure that we have a safe uh, food supply. You know, we've always said we have the safest food in the world and we do. But we know from time to time situations are going to happen, much as the E. coli issue. There was nothing deliberate in that. It was just a, something that happened, especially as people try new things like maybe going organic. There's new technology involved. There's new things we have to be able to watch out for. So we're learning all along the food line that we have to keep testing to make sure there's nothing there that would uh, possibly contribute to some kind of health effects, ill health effects in our food supply. And we don't want that. And so we're just learning to be extremely cautious. You know, as we get away from some of our inorganic fertilizers, go to organic fertilizers. There's new management procedures that have to uh, be involved there. When do you fertilize? It depends upon not only your topography, it depends upon your irrigation systems. And so we're learning a whole lot of new management practices, but uh, everybody takes this very seriously and working very hard to make sure that we maintain the credible safe food that we have in this uh, state.